In a rural area of southwest Texas in 2016, a 49 year old woman was out walking her dog. We don't know her name, so we'll call her Rhonda, and we don't know her dog's name, so the dog will be Max. Hiking with Max was Rhonda's way of unwinding and letting go of the day. As she walked, she took a moment to breathe in the fresh scent of pine trees and listen to the dried leaves crunch underneath her shoes. There was nobody else around, so Rhonda let Max off his leash. He ran ahead and played in the bushes, happy to be free after a day spent cooped up inside. But after a little while, a sharp yelp from Max cut through the quiet evening air. Rhonda sprinted down the path to where she last saw him and began shouting out his name. There were plenty of dangerous animals hiding in the tall brush. Snakes, kissing bugs, porcupines, even feral hogs were known to be spotted in this area. Max could have run into any one of them. Rhonda yelled again and again for Max, but she didn't hear anything. Then she heard whining, and Max came running toward her with his tail between his legs. Rhonda immediately clipped on his leash, relieved that he didn't have any visible injury. Rhonda decided to end the walk right there and head home. And then once she got there, she could clean Max up and make herself some dinner. The next few days were uneventful, but towards the end of that week, Rhonda started to feel under the weather. She didn't have much of an appetite, and it hurt whenever she swallowed cold drinks. She figured she might have a mild flu or maybe a sore throat, but as the days went by, she kept feeling worse and worse. She couldn't catch her breath and her chest hurt, and no matter what she did, Rhonda just could not get comfortable, especially when she laid down. Rhonda had high blood pressure, which had caused symptoms like this in the past, but she had been faithfully taking her blood pressure medication so she didn't understand why she was now feeling this bad. She decided not to take any chances and went to the emergency room of a nearby hospital. As Rhonda sat in the waiting room, all she could think about was the pain in her chest. Whatever this was, it didn't feel like a simple blood pressure issue. A nurse asked Rhonda some basic background questions, like whether she drank alcohol or used tobacco. She admitted to having the occasional drink, but she said she never smoked. She said she didn't do any drugs either. Then, Rhonda was given an electrocardiogram, which is a simple test that records the electrical activity of the heart and indicates any problems with the heartbeat. After the test was done, a doctor came in and read through the results. He said everything looked perfectly fine, but Rhonda told him she was scared. She was certain there was something going on, but he just shook his head and told her she should stay calm. She was probably just having some sort of panic attack, but despite her protests, Rhonda was just given a prescription for anxiety medication and then sent home. But as the week progressed, her pain only got worse. Rhonda couldn't take two steps without feeling nauseous. She felt like something heavy was sitting on her chest, trying to squeeze out her breath. Even her dog Max seemed to sense her pain, whining every time she sat up in bed, trying to catch her breath. Rhonda decided to go back to the ER, but this time she went to a different hospital. She didn't want to be sick, but she also didn't want a potentially dangerous condition to go untreated. And the doctors at this hospital were much more willing to listen to Rhonda. In addition to the same test she got at the other ER, this ER also ordered a CAT scan of Rhonda's chest, which is a procedure that uses a series of x-rays to create detailed images inside the body. This time, when the doctor came to Rhonda's bedside to go over her test results, Rhonda could instantly tell something was wrong. The doctor told Rhonda that there was fluid collecting in her chest. This fluid was putting pressure on her heart and causing her to feel tired and breathless. He didn't know why this fluid was collecting, but they needed to keep a close eye on it. If the pressure built up too much, Rhonda's heart could be permanently damaged. Rhonda was then officially moved from the ER to a room in the hospital itself. She was nervous, but also relieved. They might not know exactly what was wrong with her yet, but at least they weren't insisting that it was just an anxiety attack. By early the next morning, Rhonda's symptoms had not improved, and even with the pain medication, she could barely sleep. Her chest still hurt too much. A nurse came into Rhonda's room to draw blood, but right after the nurse inserted the needle into Rhonda's arm, something strange happened. Rhonda's feet and hands started turning blue. At the same time, her heart rate slowed and her blood pressure plummeted. 
The pain in Rhonda's chest grew worse, and she tried not to groan. Instead, she clenched her hands into fists so tight her nails almost cut through her skin. She thought of poor Max waiting for her at home. All she wanted was to cuddle with him and feel his wet nose on her face. As doctors rushed in, Rhonda could tell that things were just getting worse. The doctors measured her heartbeat and then gave her an injection to increase her heart rate and blood pressure. Once Rhonda was stabilized, her cardiologist arrived at her bedside. He could see that the excess fluid around Rhonda's heart was exerting more pressure. It was getting so intense that it could stop her heart from beating. There was no time for the doctor to make a precise diagnosis. Rhonda needed surgery right now. That fluid had to be drained or she was going to die. They could figure out what was actually wrong with her afterwards. Rhonda was rushed into surgery and doctors removed almost two cups of fluid from the sac surrounding Rhonda's heart. They also put in a chest tube that would help keep the fluid from building back up. Her cardiologist hoped that the procedure would be enough to stabilize her. Right away, Rhonda started to feel better. Her vital signs improved and she was able to eat a little bit and even check in with her dog sitter. After almost two weeks of feeling totally sick and now 48 hours in the hospital, Rhonda told herself that this terrible ordeal might finally be over. Over the next couple of days, she improved enough for her doctors to remove the chest tube that was draining the excess fluid from her heart. But just after getting the chest tube removed, Rhonda again started feeling intense pressure in her chest. More tests were done and they revealed that fluid was re-accumulating around her heart at an alarming rate. Rhonda's blood pressure suddenly dropped and her body went into shock. Her surgical team sprang back into action. Once again, she was wheeled into surgery to drain the fluid from around her heart. This time, almost four cups were removed, twice as much as the first time. Rhonda's cardiologist and his team placed three chest tubes around Rhonda's heart to keep the waves of pressure from killing her. After surgery, Rhonda was returned to the ICU, exhausted and barely conscious. But even all those tubes couldn't stop the fluid from building back up. Instead of getting better, Rhonda remained in critical condition. They were running out of time to save her. Her doctors watched over her with a sense of dread, wondering how they could possibly stabilize her if she crashed again. Six terrifying days later, doctors drained her heart for the third time. This time, though, her cardiologist noticed something strange in the bloody liquid they drained out of her chest. He examined it and realized that the liquid was full of blood clots. Rhonda must be bleeding internally. If one of those clots made its way into her heart, it could block an important artery. This would cause cardiac arrest and kill Rhonda in seconds. Her cardiologist ordered more scans and then carefully studied each one. And that's when he noticed something truly puzzling. Rhonda's aorta, which is the large artery connected to the heart, showed a small, thin shadow. The cardiologist was baffled by it. He knew it had to be connected to the bleeding, but he couldn't tell what it was, and he had to find out. To do this, he needed to see Rhonda's heart completely still and without any blood to obscure the view. While it sounded impossible, there was a way to do this he needed to perform an incredibly dangerous surgery, the kind of surgery that he would only do when there was no other choice. He dreaded reaching this decision, but it was the only way to save her life. Rhonda would have to be put into a state called total circulatory arrest. The surgical team would do this by first drastically lowering her body temperature. Then they would have to stop her heart from pumping. Rhonda would be in suspended animation, with no pulse, no blood pressure, and no signs of brain activity. She would basically be no different from someone who was actually dead. Putting Rhonda into the state would allow her doctors to see what was wrong with her heart, but it only gave surgeons an extremely short window of time to work, about 40 minutes. If it went on any longer, they might not be able to bring Rhonda back. As the surgical suite was prepped for the procedure, the cardiologist and his team went through every minute detail of the operation. 
Then, the surgeon took a deep breath and began the process of putting Rhonda into deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. A cooled saline solution was slowly injected into Rhonda's blood. This lowered her body temperature to somewhere between 64 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit and caused her blood to stop flowing. A machine took over her breathing. Once all her body functions had stopped, the cardiologist called for a scalpel and made his first incision. The entire surgical team watched as he cut through the sac surrounding Rhonda's heart, carefully pushing aside tiny blood vessels until he was able to make an incision in the aorta. Wearing specialized magnifying glasses, he carefully examined Rhonda's heart. Within moments, he was stunned to see an object deeply embedded inside of her aorta. He carefully removed it with micro forceps and dropped it in a specimen jar. Then he cut out the damaged part of the aorta, repaired it with the synthetic graft, and closed Rhonda back up. Then the team slowly and carefully raised Rhonda's body temperature. Her heart was restarted with a defibrillator. In minutes, blood was pumping through her veins again, and color started to return to her face. As Rhonda was wheeled back to the ICU to recover, the object that had been pulled out of her aorta was already being closely examined by pathology. By the next day, Rhonda's medical team knew the very risky surgery had worked. The fluid had stopped accumulating around Rhonda's heart, and she said she was starting to feel better. Over the next several days, the lab analyzed this object that had been pulled out of her that had basically pierced a hole through her aorta. Rhonda was in her hospital room chatting with some family when her cardiologist entered, holding something in a small glass jar. He told her that the pathology department had a little present for her. They knew what had caused her near-death crisis. The object from her aorta that had nearly killed her was an inch-long, black and extremely sharp porcupine quill. But now the question was, how had it gotten inside of her? It happened more than a month earlier, on the day she went for a walk with her dog Max in the woods. When Max ran into the brush and began whimpering and whining, he had encountered an angry porcupine. Later, when Rhonda got home, she saw several quills sticking out of Max's fur. Rhonda had painstakingly removed them, but while she was doing this, she had accidentally swallowed a porcupine quill and somehow didn't notice. The quill poked a hole in her esophagus and then made its way to her aorta where it caused her to bleed into the sac around her heart. Since she had no idea that she had swallowed a quill, she never thought it was necessary to tell her doctors about the incident with her dog and the porcupine. Three weeks after she was first admitted to the hospital, Rhonda made a full recovery and went home. She still went on long walks with Max and still let him run free into the brush. She wasn't the kind of person who lived in fear, but her heart always started to beat a little faster whenever Max ran out of sight for more than a few minutes. Somewhere out there in the brush, there might still be a stubborn porcupine with a few missing quills waddling around. And now here is our second story called The Experiment. On a spring evening in 2014, 43-year-old Amy Pearl looked out the kitchen window of her neighbor's brownstone in Brooklyn, New York. About 20 people were packed into the tiny backyard for a cookout. Amy was making a vegetable dish, so she was sauteing some wild onions that she'd picked from her mother's garden. After the onions were ready, she headed outside to join the party where the host was now cooking a giant rack of lamb on a charcoal grill. Amy mingled with her friends until it was time to eat. Then they all sat down at a long table. The lamb, wild onions, and assorted roasted vegetables made for a delicious meal. Amy even sneaked some meat to her dog, a brown and white pit bull mutt named Cola. Amy couldn't help but think about how lucky she was. She was a successful radio producer living just minutes away from Manhattan in a city full of things to do and great food to eat. And she had a group of amazing friends to enjoy it with. A few hours later, the party ended, so Amy said her goodbyes 
and headed back to her own apartment with her dog. After she got home, Amy went to bed. It was midnight, and she was ready to get some sleep. But a couple of hours later, she woke up and just felt totally strange. A wave of anxiety hit her, but she wasn't sure why. She decided to get up and go to the bathroom. When she walked in and flipped on the light, she took a look at her face in the mirror. She was shocked when she saw her reflection. Her face looked misshapen and her eyes were swollen. Amy could barely recognize herself and immediately knew something was wrong. Then she was hit by this awful dizzy spell. In a daze, Amy walked back toward her bedroom. She was so dizzy she had to hold on to the walls for support, but she managed to get back to her room and climb into her bed. As soon as she lay down, she felt like she was going to pass out. Amy stood back up and attempted to walk off her dizziness as her dog, Cola, followed her around the apartment. As she paced around, Amy started to have these intense stomach cramps. Her mind began to race and she wondered what was happening. Amy wondered if she had accidentally poisoned herself with something she ate from the dinner party. She thought maybe there might have been a snail hidden on the wild onions or maybe the onions themselves were just poisonous. She was worried she might have poisoned her friends too. So far, no one had texted or called her though, so she hoped everything was okay. As her anxiety intensified, Amy got up and returned to the bathroom and splashed cold water on her face, which helped calm her down a bit. She dried her face off with a hand towel and realized she no longer felt dizzy. Amy told herself that maybe a night's rest would just fix everything, so she returned to her bedroom and finally fell asleep. The next morning, Amy woke up feeling much better. Her stomach had stopped hurting and her face looked normal again. However, she wanted to figure out what had happened. She figured the best way to start was to check in on her friends who had gone to the same party the night before. Amy picked up her phone and dialed the neighbor who had hosted the cookout. She didn't want to alarm them by talking about her symptoms, so she just asked them how they felt the party went. The host was very happy with everything and thanked Amy for making the wild onions. Amy got off the phone feeling totally relieved, and so she called some more people who attended the party, and again, everyone just seemed fine and had a great time. Amy was left totally bewildered and without any answers about what had happened to her, but she ultimately just chalked up the whole thing to an upset stomach and tried to move on. A week later, on a Saturday night, Amy decided to stay in with her dog, Cola, instead of going out with her friends. She decided to make a cheeseburger and french fries for dinner, so she pulled a frozen patty out of the freezer and turned on the stove. When the burger was done, Amy placed a slice of cheese right on top and watched it melt. Then she put the burger on a bun and added the fries that she had cooked in the oven. Amy grabbed a can of soda from her fridge. She sat down on the couch next to Cola and took her first bite of the burger. The patty was a pink medium rare, the cheese was melted and gooey, and the fries were perfectly salted. Amy savored every bite and then watched a movie. Two hours later, as the credits of the movie began to roll, Amy hugged her dog. As he licked her face, she started to feel lightheaded. She stood up too quickly and nearly fell over. Amy braced herself against the wall and struggled to catch her breath. Her chest began to tighten and she started breathing faster and faster, and so kind of in a panic, Amy began trying to take deep breaths to calm herself down, and as her breathing did begin to settle, all she could think about was what had happened to her after her neighborhood party a week earlier. But this felt different, and much worse. Amy made her way into the bathroom, and just like last week, she looked in the mirror and her face looked swollen, and now she noticed there was also a rash on her hands. She lifted her shirt and saw that her stomach was also covered in swollen red hives. She didn't know what to do. Her only thought was to make her way to the living room and unlock her front door just in case she needed to call 911 but passed out before paramedics arrived. Then she staggered into her bedroom as Cola followed along. Amy wondered if there was a virus going around or if maybe she was allergic to a new pollen or worse, maybe she was allergic to her dog Cola. Amy didn't want to think about that possibility because she loved her dog. She remembered how helpful sleep had been the last time this happened, a week earlier, so she decided not to call 911 just yet. She relocked her front door and made her way back to her room. Exhausted, she collapsed onto her bed and she fell asleep.
Just like the last time she got sick, Amy woke up the next morning feeling much better. The swelling on her stomach had gone down, and the hives were less noticeable, but she was still worried, so she grabbed her laptop off the floor. She opened a web browser and typed all of her symptoms into the Google search bar. A list of articles and links popped up. Amy scanned the list, her eyes widening as she saw a particular article. She clicked that link and read more. It was about a man in Florida who had experienced the same sudden symptoms as her. She wasn't sure what it all meant, but maybe it was connected to what was happening with her. Amy printed out the article because she felt like she was onto something. A few days later, Amy was seated on the examination table as her doctor stood close by. Her hives had disappeared by the time her appointment had arrived, and the doctor didn't seem too worried. Despite this, Amy described the two incidents and her various symptoms in great detail as the doctor took notes. But the entire time, Amy was thinking about the article she had printed out. She had even brought it with her to the appointment. Amy hesitated to bring up the article to her doctor. She didn't want to sound like one of those people who self-diagnosed based on what they read online. Instead, when she was on her way out of the appointment, she left the article with the receptionist and asked them to please give it to her doctor. The next day, Amy called the doctor and asked whether she could be tested for the condition the article mentioned. The doctor said he had read the article and that in his opinion, it just wasn't possible. Amy had nothing to worry about and he didn't think she needed to do any special testing. He was confident that it was just not a problem. Amy felt kind of defeated and no closer to knowing what had actually happened to her. A few days later, Amy was back to feeling basically like herself. She was at the local supermarket, pushing a cart full of groceries down the aisle. She eyed the food in her cart and was struck with an idea. Her doctor had seemed so sure there wasn't anything wrong with her, but Amy wasn't as certain, so she decided to run a test on herself. She would go to her mom's house and do the experiment there, just in case something terrible happened. Later that afternoon, Amy's mother, Susan Von Eggers, stood at the island in her kitchen in Danbury, Connecticut, about two hours away from Brooklyn. Susan was cutting up vegetables from her garden when she heard a knock at the door. She walked over to let in Amy, and then she gave her a hug. As Susan led her daughter back to the kitchen, Amy told her about this experiment she had planned. She was going to cook some food and eat it as a test, then wait to see if she got sick. Susan didn't know what to make out of Amy's experiment, but she was determined to help her daughter figure out what had made her so sick. Susan walked out into the spacious backyard where she fired up the grill and then they cooked their meal. Shortly after, they took a seat at the patio table. It was time for the experiment. Susan watched closely as Amy took her first bite of food. Her daughter slowly chewed and swallowed. They both waited, but so far, nothing out of the ordinary happened. Then Susan began eating. She soon noticed that Amy had barely touched the rest of her food. Amy said she was just too nervous and didn't want to eat anymore. Susan felt bad for Amy. Normally, her daughter had a healthy appetite and a deep appreciation for food. But the next two hours went by and Susan and Amy relaxed in the backyard, chatting and enjoying the sunshine, and Amy just seemed totally fine, which was a huge relief for Susan. But several minutes later, she noticed Amy became very quiet and then grabbed at her stomach. She quickly excused herself to the bathroom. Susan watched, unsure what to do, as Amy jogged to the back door and disappeared inside. 20 minutes later, Amy returned and looked very pale. She asked if her mother could drive her to the emergency room. Susan's stomach dropped, and for a split second, she couldn't think straight. She jumped up and said she needed to change her clothes. Even as she said it, she realized how absurd it sounded. She frantically ran to her bedroom, but a minute later, she heard something slam against her door. Susan opened the door and saw that Amy had collapsed on the floor in the hallway. Susan immediately felt so bad for delaying getting Amy to the hospital. She ran over and kneeled down and leaned close to her daughter's face, and she could tell that Amy was still breathing. Susan found Amy's phone on the ground next to her. She realized that Amy must have thrown it at her door to get her attention. Susan picked up Amy's phone and she dialed 911. Paramedics arrived and immediately took Amy to the hospital. She was conscious when she arrived at the emergency room a few minutes later. She was immediately given a shot of a drug called epinephrine, 
to prevent her from going into anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock is a severe allergic reaction that can result in fainting, difficulty in breathing, and even death if it's not treated right away. Amy was able to speak, so she was able to tell the ER doctor what her theory was for what was going on with her. Amy wasn't sure the doctor believed her, but the doctor promised to run the necessary tests to prove or disprove Amy's theory. Amy was stabilized and moved to a hospital room. Her mother was by her side, and they waited anxiously for the results of the tests. A couple of hours later, the ER doctor rushed in. He said he knew exactly what was happening and that Amy had been right. The article Amy had found two weeks ago was about a man who had developed a meat allergy. The doctor who Amy had first shown this article to just didn't believe that it was possible that Amy could have this allergy and so did not think the test was necessary. But Amy was determined to find out, so she attempted that experiment, which unfortunately worked. She and her mom had grilled that porterhouse steak at her mom's house. Amy had only taken a couple of bites, but it was enough to set off an allergic reaction that almost killed her. And now the doctor in the ER confirmed it for her. Amy had a life-threatening allergy to red meat. Finally, Amy understood exactly what was wrong with her. But even though she had a diagnosis, she still wasn't satisfied. In fact, it led Amy to a bigger question. How could she have suddenly become allergic to something she had eaten without any issues her entire life? When her doctor explained the reason, it all made sense to her, as crazy as it sounded. It all started a few weeks before the neighborhood cookout, when Amy woke up one morning. The back of her arm felt itchy, and when she scratched it, she discovered a tick. She knew exactly where it had come from, her dog Cola. The tick had clearly been on her dog, and then hopped onto Amy in the middle of the night while Cola was sleeping in bed with her. When Amy was bitten by that tick, she developed a new allergy to red meat called alpha-gal syndrome. The tick carries a sugar molecule called alpha-gal, which is found in the blood of the animals the tick usually bites, such as cows, sheep, rabbits, deer, or pigs. When a tick bites a human, it automatically transmits alpha-gal into that person's body. After Amy was bitten, she developed a sensitivity to alpha-gal. This meant that her body now saw the sugar molecule as a foreign invader and attacked it. So every time Amy ate red meat, which contains alpha-gal, she would become progressively sicker. Her body would release histamines, which cause allergy symptoms such as hives, swelling, and difficulty breathing, as well as anaphylactic shock. It just so happens that Amy's symptoms were particularly severe. It is estimated that almost 450,000 people in the United States have developed alpha-gal allergy in the same way as Amy, which would make it the 10th most common allergy in the entire country. Up to 60% of people with red meat allergies can experience severe symptoms. There is currently no cure. After Amy learned about her diagnosis, she realized she could never eat red meat again, which included beef, venison, pork, and lamb. They had been her favorite foods since she was a kid. After being released from the hospital, she decided to go on a strict vegetarian diet for personal reasons. She continues to go see her allergist for testing to see if anything has changed, but her alpha-gal antibody levels are still present in her bloodstream. Now, Amy has made peace with the lifestyle change and has even learned to appreciate it, especially considering her deep love of animals. In the summer of 1998, 32-year-old Catherine Gordon sat curled up on the couch with a book inside of her home in Atlanta, Georgia. Across the living room, her husband lifted their newborn baby, Jade, out of the bassinet and carried her toward Catherine to breastfeed. It should have been a sweet moment. Catherine thought about how amazing it was that she actually had a baby. It wasn't that long ago that she was a self-described party girl who thought more about the next bikini contest she could enter than about having a child of her own. But now, the former model, who once moonlighted as a bartender, was a stay-at-home mother with a husband in law school. They were now the model of respectability, and their little baby Jade completed their perfect little family. But Catherine didn't think being a mom would hurt so much. Every time Jade latched onto her breast for milk, Catherine felt a burning sensation tear through her chest. 
It hurt so much she could feel tears welling up in her eyes. Her husband, John, had tried to reassure her that a lot of new moms experienced difficulties with breastfeeding, and Catherine wanted to believe him. Maybe she was still learning how to do it right. Catherine cupped her hand around the soft, warm fuzz of Jade's head and guided her from John's hands to her breast. The baby tilted her face up to stare at her mother as she began to nurse. Catherine started to smile at Jade's big round eyes, but then she noticed her baby's lips. They were bright red, covered in blood. A bolt of fear shot through Catherine, and she pulled Jade off her breast to get a closer look. It didn't look like the blood was coming from Jade's mouth. Instead, it seemed to be coming from Catherine's milk ducts. She was relieved the baby was okay, but what in the world was going on with her? She called for John and jumped up from the couch to hand him their baby. Then she called her doctor and said she needed an appointment right away. The nurse said she could squeeze her in the next day. By the next morning, Catherine was exhausted. She'd barely slept the night before, between waking up for the baby and also worrying about what was happening with her breasts. If it wasn't for the pain in her chest, she might have fallen asleep right there. But her doctor, the same OBGYN who had delivered Jade a month earlier, could not have been kinder. She asked Catherine questions about her pain and carefully examined her breast to pinpoint where the pain was coming from. She also had Catherine produce some milk for analysis in the lab. Then she smiled and explained that Catherine had mastitis, a bacterial infection that targets breast tissue, causing it to swell. The swelling put pressure on Catherine's milk ducts, which led to the pain Catherine felt when she fed Jade. It also led to the bleeding. Mastitis is a very common illness that affects many new mothers, and it's easy to fix with antibiotics. The doctor promised that once Catherine finished taking the medication for 10 days, she'd be back to normal. Catherine exhaled in relief, but something was still bothering her that she needed to share. She told the doctor that 10 years ago, she had gotten breast implants while she was working as a swimwear model in Virginia Beach, Virginia. At the time, Catherine had been excited to get them. They gave her such a full figure that she won beauty contests all over the region. But now, Catherine wondered if the procedure could have caused any problems with breastfeeding her baby. The doctor promised Catherine the infection had nothing to do with the implants. This seemed like a totally ordinary case of mastitis, and she was sure Catherine would feel better after taking the antibiotics. Catherine thanked the doctor and headed home to tell John, hopeful that she would soon feel better. Three days after Catherine finished her course of antibiotics for her mastitis, she and John sat down to a big meal that she'd prepared. Catherine was feeling great and had put Jade down to sleep with no problems earlier in the evening. The antibiotics had taken away all the pain from breastfeeding, and she'd even felt good enough to go to the gym earlier in the week. It was rare these days that Catherine and John got to spend time alone, and now John was very eager to tell his wife about his busy day. Besides attending law school, John also managed a chain of restaurants and bars, so he was juggling a lot. He had always been a type A personality, never satisfied unless he had a new challenge. Catherine had worked hard too, both as a model and then also a sales rep, but now she was content to look after their home and be with the baby. She sometimes thought that there was something a little invisible about being a stay-at-home mom, but she still cherished this time with Jade, even if she did sometimes feel like she was just her husband's cheerleader. A few minutes into dinner, Catherine began to feel extremely tired. She glanced at the clock on the wall. It was only 8 o'clock, and normally she was still full of energy at this time. She tried her best to ignore the fatigue and concentrated as best as she could on what John was saying about his constitutional law class. She told herself that, you know, long days with Jade were exhausting and probably she just needed more sleep. But when Catherine and John finished eating their meals and they stood up to clear the table, Catherine felt so lightheaded that she immediately sat back down before she fell. As she sat there collecting herself, Catherine realized that her muscles were beginning to ache too. And so she hoped she wasn't now coming down with the flu right when she was finally cured of mastitis. John rushed over to her and asked her what was wrong. Catherine didn't want to alarm him, so she smiled and said she was just tired. He squeezed her hand and told her he would clean up. She should just go to bed and get some rest. Catherine nodded and slowly got up and walked to the bedroom, hoping she'd feel back to normal in the morning. 
A month later, Catherine limped back into the waiting room of her OBGYN's office. She had tried for weeks to get better on her own, hoping that her healthy eating habits and drinking lots of fresh juice would speed up her recovery, but no matter what she did, it didn't help. She just kept getting worse. These days, her fatigue and aching muscles were making it so hard to get out of bed in the morning. And recently, her joints had started to feel hot and tender. Catherine now relied on a group of friends to help her care for the baby all day and make meals, while John started handling more of the house cleaning and Jade's nightly feedings. Catherine felt so guilty. She knew that her mysterious symptoms were making John's life way harder and kind of testing his patience. John was trying to be a good husband and help out around the house, but Catherine found it impossible to keep from criticizing him when he left a dirty dish in the sink or a paper out of place. Catherine couldn't help that she was a perfectionist, and she knew it totally grated on him when she asked so much of him while saying that she was just too tired and achy to keep the house organized herself. Catherine knew something was wrong, and it probably was not mastitis. She was hoping the doctor could help her figure out what was really wrong so she could start feeling like herself again. As Catherine sat on the examining table in her hospital gown, the doctor flipped through the pages of her medical chart and told her what she saw. Catherine's vital signs were normal. Her blood work was normal. She didn't have a major disease like cancer or heart disease, and she didn't have a minor one like mastitis either. In fact, as far as the doctor could see, there was nothing physically wrong with Catherine at all. Then she asked Catherine how she was feeling mentally and if everything was all right at home. Catherine admitted that things were a bit tense these days between her and John, and she explained that her fatigue was making it really hard to take care of her baby. The doctor's expression grew serious, and she sat down next to Catherine. She suspected that her fatigue was due to postpartum depression, a condition that often afflicts new mothers and can be treated with counseling or antidepressants. Catherine was stunned. She did not feel depressed. If she was struggling emotionally, it was only because of her physical discomfort, not the other way around. She told the doctor that when she looked down at Jade and saw her baby smile, she knew that Jade was the best thing in her life. She just needed to get back in good physical shape so she could be the mother she always wanted to be. But the doctor made it clear that Catherine had it wrong. She was confident that the best way for Catherine to get better was to be treated not by her, not by the doctor's office, but by a therapist. Catherine always considered herself the kind of person who speaks up for herself. If someone didn't take her seriously, it made her angry, and she often said so. But this time, as a tired new mom in a hospital gown that didn't quite cover her back, Catherine just fell silent. She thanked the doctor for her concern and then just got up and left. The next day, Catherine was at home playing with Jade on a mat next to the couch. She was dressed in her workout clothes and waiting for a babysitter to arrive. Even though she still felt achy and exhausted basically all of the time, she was determined to get back to the gym. She'd felt good working out while she recovered from mastitis, so she hoped that some gentle exercise would help her get her body back under control. A few minutes later, the doorbell rang. Catherine let in the babysitter and kissed Jade goodbye, then she slowly headed out to her car to drive to the gym. Once she got there, the familiar sounds of clattering gym equipment and people working out boosted Catherine's spirits. She felt a surge of energy just watching everyone else lift weights and pedal stationary bikes. Catherine took some deep breaths and carefully stepped onto a treadmill. She set the machine to a moderate walking pace and started out slowly, savoring the feeling of movement after weeks of basically being inactive. She told herself it was mind over matter, but after a few minutes, she felt a tingling sensation in her legs and a shooting pain running down her left arm. Catherine kept walking and tried to ignore the pain, but it was no use. Her body was screaming at her to stop. So eventually she pushed the stop button on the treadmill and headed to a bench. She sat down and began massaging her muscles, but that didn't help. Catherine shook her head in frustration. She had barely begun to work out and now she was already in so much pain that she needed to grab her gym bag and head home. But when she stood up to leave, she felt yet another strange sensation, an intense itching, and it was coming from inside of her chest. 
Because Catherine could not literally itch the inside of her chest, she reflexively just began tapping on the middle of her chest with her hand, but the itching feeling didn't go away. And so Catherine tapped harder, and then finally she made a fist and just started banging on her chest. But she still felt this unbearable tingling sensation rising up under her skin. Other people now were staring at her as she pounded away madly at her chest. Finally, she dropped her fist in embarrassment when she realized everybody was staring at her, and then as quick as she could, she grabbed her things and headed out of the gym back to her car. Catherine felt helpless. Her whole body seemed to just be falling apart. She knew she needed more help. Maybe a different doctor would have a better diagnosis than her OBGYN, who seemed convinced that it was all in Catherine's head. As soon as Catherine got back home, she made an appointment with her primary care doctor. A few days later, Catherine sat on yet another examination table, this one in her primary care doctor's office. She described her original fatigue and muscle aches and bleeding nipples, but she made it clear her condition was really getting worse and worse. Now she was suffering from weakness and tingling in her limbs and this weird constant itching inside of her chest. And Catherine was happy to see that her doctor was taking detailed notes as she spoke, and he had a focused, interested expression on his face. When she was finally done speaking, her doctor tapped his pen on his clipboard for a moment, and then he gave her a serious look. He told her he thought she had something called fibromyalgia, which is a disorder that causes pain and tenderness throughout the body and often results in fatigue. Scientists don't fully understand what causes it, he admitted, and there are no real tests for it either. Doctors tend to diagnose patients with the condition when they can't find another explanation for widespread chronic body aches. And although Catherine's doctor didn't actually say this to her, it is the case that doctors will sometimes default to this vague diagnosis, fibromyalgia, when they basically think it could actually all be in the patient's head, just like Catherine's OBGYN had suggested. Catherine's primary care doctor told Catherine that there's no cure for fibromyalgia, he said the best he could do was prescribe her a painkiller called OxyContin to help manage the symptoms. And so Catherine was relieved to finally hear that something was physically wrong with her, even though it was frightening to hear that there was no cure. But still, it didn't seem like all of her symptoms could be explained away by this fibromyalgia. And so Catherine asked if there were any more tests he could run or anything he could do at all to try to figure out any of the underlying reasons behind her pain. But the doctor shook his head and said no, and then stood up to end the appointment. He said the OxyContin would help her feel better, and that was the best he could do. And so as Catherine left his office, she started to feel like, once again, a doctor was casually writing off her symptoms rather than seriously looking into the root cause. She didn't know if she believed the fibromyalgia diagnosis any more than the postpartum depression diagnosis. And she wasn't sure she wanted to start taking OxyContin, which can be very addictive. Because even if it did help mask her symptoms, she knew it wouldn't actually help cure the underlying reason behind them. She wanted a cure, not just a temporary fix. Still, Catherine was enough of a dutiful patient that she did go to the pharmacy and she picked up the four pill bottles that were waiting for her, just in case. Two months later, Catherine laid on the couch completely exhausted. She had decided to follow her intuition and not take the OxyContin, but now her symptoms were getting so much worse. The aches were deeper in her muscles, the joint pain felt hotter and sharper, the numbness, tingling, and itching inside of her chest were nearly constant. On top of that, she was getting more tired than ever. She had just put Jade to bed, and now she didn't even have the energy to make dinner. So John was heating up some leftover pizza for them to eat. Catherine eventually heard the beep of the microwave, and so she dragged herself out to the kitchen. She winced in pain as she sat at the table while John silently served them their food. Catherine could tell he was mad, but she didn't really know what to say. So she just sat there quietly while they ate, and then she got up to do the dishes. But Catherine was in so much pain that she had to grip the side of the counter for support. John watched her silently and just shook his head. 
Then he told her that she had been complaining of aches and weakness for months, but she refused to do anything about it. Two doctors had given her a diagnosis, but she had just rejected both and refused to follow their advice. He was exhausted too and at his wit's end, trying to understand what was going on with his wife. In fact, he wasn't even sure there was anything actually wrong with her. Before she could say anything, John turned and walked out of the room. Catherine stood at the counter for another minute and then stumbled to a kitchen chair and just sat there crying for what felt like hours. Finally, she stopped crying and dried her face off with a napkin and told herself that she couldn't give up yet. Maybe there was still an answer for her out there, and even if she didn't have her husband's support, she'd continue to look for answers alone. She had to keep trying for Jade. A few months later, in the spring of 1999, Catherine finally got an appointment with a rheumatologist who was an expert both on fibromyalgia and arthritis. Since that fight with John in the kitchen, Catherine had gone out and seen various other doctors, but none of them had been able to help. But now, as she waited in this latest exam room, she felt hopeful that this specialist could solve her case once and for all. After a short wait, the doctor came in. He was an older man, and although he seemed like he knew what he was doing, she didn't like the way he called Catherine honey. She decided she would forgive his sexism if he could offer her something besides addictive painkillers as a solution. And he did. The doctor began scolding Catherine for not listening to what doctors had already told her. The problem is in your head. He had reviewed her charts, and as far as he was concerned, she didn't have a disease. And until she could accept that and get herself together, her personal life would continue to suffer. Partway through the doctor's lecture, Catherine just stopped listening, like when she was getting scolded as a kid. She felt humiliated and desperate and mad. She knew there was something physically wrong with her, but she was now starting to feel her will to fight slipping away. And she knew the doctor was right about one thing. Her marriage was crumbling under the weight of her sickness. Catherine pushed herself up from her chair and silently left the office. She walked slowly to her car, having to stop periodically to lean against the wall to rest. When Catherine got home, she paid the babysitter and put Jade in the playpen in the living room. Then she lay down on the couch and watched as her little daughter crawled around the space. Jade was nearly one years old, and Catherine loved to see her blossoming into a little toddler. But watching from the couch also made Catherine feel guilty and totally inadequate. She wanted to play with her little girl and crawl around on the floor with her, but she just couldn't. Catherine told Jade how beautiful and special she was, but to her surprise, the words that came out of her mouth sounded funny, almost like she was drunk. She sat up straight and tried to speak normally, but again, the words that tumbled out were ragged and slow. And so Catherine thought to herself, oh my God, I can't even talk anymore. Catherine started to feel a rising sense of panic. If her symptoms got much worse, she wouldn't be able to care for her baby at all. As the sun faded, Catherine managed to feed Jade and get her to sleep. She promised herself that she would clean up the baby's mess in the living room, but first she just needed to lay back down on the couch. An hour later, the front door opened and her husband, John, walked in. Catherine was still laying on the couch tucked underneath a blanket, and she could immediately feel her husband's disapproval as he stared at her and then also at the messy room all around her. John dropped his bag and sat down next to Catherine. He told her enough was enough. It was time to suck it up and get herself together. Catherine felt tears roll down her face, but she didn't have the energy to respond. They'd had this conversation over and over again, and it always arrived at the same place, with John not believing her. And she just did not have the energy to fight anymore. So she just laid there, letting tears stream down her face. John didn't say anything more either. After a minute, he just got up and left. As Catherine lay there alone, she felt something shift inside of her. She'd been fighting with her doctors, her husband, and her body for months. She realized that she'd gotten to the end of a rope, 
After 10 months of fighting, she felt hopeless, alone, and totally out of options. Catherine could not keep living like this. That night, Catherine dragged herself into the bathroom and opened the medicine cabinet to get her toothbrush. Her four unopened bottles of OxyContin were standing on the glass shelf. She realized the pills would be more than enough to end her life. Catherine closed the cabinet, hobbled over to the bed, and crawled under the covers. As she tossed and turned, she kept thinking about those bottles of OxyContin. She looked over at John, who was sound asleep. She didn't want to leave him and Jade alone, but she just couldn't bear the pain anymore. She was done. Tonight, she would sleep beside her husband for the last time. The next day, she'd make sure Jade was with someone, and while John was at law school, she would overdose on her pills. Catherine closed her eyes, satisfied that she finally had a plan. Then she fell into a deep sleep. But as she slept, Catherine had a strange dream. A jumble of images flickered through her mind, like some broken film reel. She couldn't make sense of what they meant, and then she heard a voice. It was deep and powerful and cut through all the chaos of her dream. The voice told her that there was something poisonous growing inside of her that needed to come out. Catherine bolted upright, her heart pounding in her chest. The dream felt so real that suddenly she felt like she could taste poison in her mouth. Catherine suddenly knew that she had just gotten a message that could save her life. The next day, Catherine sat in the waiting room of yet another doctor's office. This time, she was meeting with a surgeon named Susan Kolb. The voice in Catherine's dream had told her that whatever this poison was in her body, it needed to come out, like be surgically removed. And Catherine was almost positive she knew what it was. Now she just needed to convince a surgeon to actually perform the surgery. Catherine described her symptoms to the surgeon for what felt like the millionth time. When she mentioned the shooting pain in her arm, Dr. Kolb stopped her. She said she'd seen those symptoms before, and they weren't caused by postpartum depression or fibromyalgia. Dr. Kolb was pretty sure she knew what was making Catherine sick. It was exactly what the voice in Catherine's dream had said it was. But there was no way to know for sure without actually doing surgery. She needed to visually confirm her diagnosis, and no amount of imaging from MRI or CT scans would be enough. She would have to cut Catherine open in the hope that she was right, exposing her to all the risks of surgery from bleeding to infection to organ damage. Catherine felt a surge of fear and also hope. The prospect of undergoing serious surgery was terrifying, but far less so than the prospect of continuing to get weaker and sicker. So she took a deep breath and told Dr. Kolb to please schedule her for the soonest available time slot. Three days later, Catherine lay on an operating table at a local hospital. Dr. Kolb stood at her side and asked if she had any last questions or doubts before they began the procedure. Catherine confirmed that she didn't, and Dr. Kolb nodded to the anesthesiologist. They stepped forward and put some drugs into Catherine's IV. Dr. Kolb waited until Catherine was in a deep sleep before reaching for her scalpel. Then she made a quick incision in Catherine's skin, revealing the fatty tissue beneath. With precise and careful strokes, she continued to cut deeper and deeper. She kept going until her knife was underneath Catherine's pectoralis major muscle, the largest muscle in the chest. There, Dr. Kolb saw what she was looking for. The round implants from Catherine's breast augmentation surgery 11 years earlier. The implants were in the right position, and they didn't appear to have any holes, which was a common problem with implants. But these were not the issues Dr. Kolb was looking for. She reached down and loosened one of the implants and then pulled it out, and immediately, Dr. Kolb was shocked at what she saw. The problem was so obvious, the doctor knew right away she would not need to run any additional tests to confirm her diagnosis. The implant was supposed to be full of clear saline liquid that normally keeps it round and firm. But instead, the liquid inside of Catherine's implant was pitch black and full of tiny floating particles. Dr. Kolb quickly switched to the other side of Catherine's chest 
and removed the second implant, and it too was also black and full of particles. Dr. Kolb told her astonished surgical team that she had found what was making Catherine sick, and the cause was as shocking as it was unlikely. It would turn out Catherine's breast implants were full of a black mold, the same kind of fungus that grows in people's bathrooms. The contamination probably began about 10 months earlier, right after Catherine's breasts began bleeding as she was feeding Jade. She really did have mastitis then, but the antibiotics that her doctor had given her to treat it had caused a brand new problem. The drugs had cleared up the mastitis, but they did their job almost too well. They also killed healthy bacteria inside of Catherine's body that helped protect against other infections. And so as a result, Catherine soon developed this fungal infection that sneaked into her breast implants through a loose valve or seal. From there, the fungus started breeding inside of the liquid saline of the implants and began releasing a steady stream of poisonous toxins back into Catherine's body that were making her very sick. If Catherine had ignored the warning signs from her body and her powerful dream, the implants could have easily eventually burst and killed her. But she listened to the voice in that dream, and it saved her life. Dr. Kolb put Catherine on a two-month course of a common antifungal medication called fluconazole. After it was completed, Catherine felt much better. It was a long road to recovery, but eventually, Catherine would feel totally normal. She and John were able to work through the relationship issues that manifested during her illness, and they would actually go on to write a book together about relationships. Two months after her implants were removed, Catherine became pregnant with her son, Cole. She continues to live a healthy life with no long-term effects from her fungal infection. The FDA now requires that breast implant manufacturers include prominent boxed warnings and updated recommendations designed to detect leaks in the implants. From Ballin Studios and Wondery, this is Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries, hosted by me, Mr. Ballin. A quick note about our stories. We use aliases sometimes because we don't know the names of the real people in the story. And also, in most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but everything is based on a lot of research. And a reminder, the content in this episode is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This episode was written by Nora Battelle. Our editor is Heather Dundas. Sound design is by Matthew Cellelli. Coordinating producer is Sophia Martins. Our senior producer is Alex Benedon. Our associate producers and researchers are Sarah Vitak and Tasia Palaconda. Fact-checking was done by Sheila Patterson. For Ballin Studios, our head of production is Zach Levitt. Script editing is by Scott Allen and Evan Allen. Our coordinating producer is Matub Zare. Executive producers are myself, Mr. Ballin, and Nick Witters. For Wondery, our head of sound is Marcelino Villapondo. Senior producers are Laura Donna Palavoda and Dave Schilling. Senior managing producer is Ryan Lore. Our executive producers are Aaron O'Flaherty and Marshall Louis for Wondery. Wondery.